Escape from Tarkov is a game that means a lot to me. It's a game I've thoroughly enjoyed for the past few years, and it's an excellent evolution of the concept of the Battle Royale. When Player Unknown's Battlegrounds came out, it opened up a brand new niche for developers, resulting in a slew of popular titles. Tarkov and Hunt Showdown were among those, further developing the niche in their own direction and inspiring a brand new wave of developers to create a new genre of games as a result. The name isn't fully settled. There's only a handful of games I'm aware of that fit the mold, but some people call them raid-based battle royales, some call them raid games, some call them extraction shooters. Now, personally, I prefer raid-based battle royale, but I'll be using extraction shooter in this video for the sake of clarity, because I will also be talking about battle royales and the part they played in getting to this point. Before we go any further, though, I do want to give a disclaimer. Escape from Tarkov is a fully Russian game. With current events being what they are, I can understand people not wanting to purchase the game. But I do want to clarify that I purchased the game like three and a half years ago before the conflict kicked off. I'm also not going to go into any specifics on my views of the conflict because there are plenty of other people better qualified to talk about it. Also, YouTube has been getting a bit weird in terms of its policies, so if you stick around to the end, I'll have an announcement regarding that. Needless to say, I'm not telling you to buy it, but I'm also not telling you to not buy it. You're an adult, you can make your own choices in that regard. This video is more to talk about what makes the game so unique and how the trends it set are starting to propagate through the industry. With all of that out of the way, let's get into it. To fully understand what makes the game so unique and fresh feeling, I think it's best if we rewind the clock. The year is 2013. I'm 16 years old, and The Hunger Games, which had just come out the year prior, is still fresh in the minds of everyone. To some, this is because they like the books and movies, but to me and many other gamers, it's because people were experimenting with recreating it in a variety of games. Most notably, there were the survival games in Minecraft and the Rust Hunger Game servers. This is also when the DayZ mod for Arma 2 first rolled out, so many people had that fresh in their minds as well. DayZ was an experience all its own, but many people further modded the game to increase player interactions and conflict. Eventually, mods of the mod were also created for a similar Hunger Games experience. My understanding is that there were a few different ones, but the one which started gaining traction was called DayZ Battle Royale. And it was created by Brendan Green under the username Player Unknown, who would go on to pioneer the entire genre we now call Battle Royales. Brendan worked on the mod until the release of Arma 3, which offered a much more stable platform to build on top of than a mod of an already aging game. In total, he worked for about two years between the two mods, but in 2015 is when he was able to start taking the game to a mainstream audience. Sony recruited him to work with Daybreak Games, who at the time had an early access zombie survival game, another genre which briefly got popular in the wake of DayZ, called H1Z1. He was brought on as an advisor to help them make a Battle Royale spin-off, which ended up being named H1Z1 King of the Kill. Following this moderate success, Brendan caught the attention of South Korean developer Blue Hole Games, who wanted to bring him on to develop a brand new Battle Royale from scratch. And this is when the genre blew up with Player Unknown's Battlegrounds. Now, PUBG was a phenomenon. For about two years straight, it was the bulk of what my friends and I played, because honestly, at the time, nothing could compare. And I think the majority of it boiled down to feeling like there were actual stakes. For the first time, you needed to actually care about dying, because it didn't matter if you were the first out or the final kill of the round, death is death. So you better queue up for a new game, buddy. Better luck next time. This led to a wider swing of emotions players could have. You could have lower, rage-inducing lows, dying in your first encounter as a result of horrible luck with loot, or legitimate fear of losing what you had and worked hard to scrounge for, which some people call gear fear. Or there was the pleasure of proving yourself to be the best in the lobby of 100 other people, claiming that winner-winner chicken dinner. In its success, PUBG was able to claim multiple world records, and other developers seeing this soon followed suit with competing games. Fortnite and Apex are the two biggest competitors today, but really there were tons of games trying to shake up and tweak the formula laid out by PUBG. The trend even spread to non-shooters, with games like Battle Right Royale and Tetris 99. And I know it's honestly silly sounding, but Tetris 99 slaps. However, despite their popularity, Battle Royales can have issues with player retention. PUBG at its peak was Battle Royales in their most pure form, and that gave it the first mover advantage, giving it the bulk of the audience. As time went on, new issues worked their way in, and that led to a steady decline. Fortnite and Apex are popular because they stick pretty close to that original formula, but cater to very different audiences in how they differentiate themselves. The bulk of what was coming out during PUBG's decline, however, either copied the formula too closely and thus had a hard time attracting players who already had the PUBG experience, or could be described as gimmicky, attracting players by having something that made them different, but with limited replayability. But then, two games came out right around the same time as each other, both with similar ideas. 
the first incarnations of extraction shooters. They scaled back on the map size and number of players, in exchange giving a more detailed and varied environment to play in. And rather than being a self-contained match where success or failure didn't have any influence on future games, extraction shooters had a certain level of persistence. Meaning if you weren't going to win the round, it behooved you to at least live to fight another day. If you were around during this time, the one you probably heard of first is Hunt Showdown. Hunt was interesting when it first came out because there was no circle, there was no paradrop, there was no mad dash for loot in an attempt to gain a one-up on everyone else. Instead, you got to customize your loadout before you entered the match and you had an objective find and kill the boss monster on the map, and extract with the bounty before somebody else comes to take it from you. If you get out, you can spend that bounty to get more weapons, gear, and perks to go at it again. Each raid, your account got experience, and with each level up, you could unlock new gear. To use shotguns as an example, where you start with access to a single barrel break action shotgun, as you level up, you eventually get access to a double barrel, and later a pump action, each of which lets you stay in the fight longer and be more aggressive. This wasn't a new concept, FPSs had been doing this for years, but it did add a layer of long-term progression to the Battle Royale formula, which was able to keep people coming back. The other game which came out right around this same time is Escape from Tarkov, which in fact released before Hunt by about 8 months. However, its popularity instead grew more steadily over time, via creators and streamers playing the game, their content working as a sort of word-of-mouth marketing. Hello gamers, welcome back to another My, 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 my. This highlighted a fundamental difference in how Hunt and Tarkov came to be. Hunt was backed by Crytek, meaning they had AAA backing in their development, a marketing budget which meant you would likely see them first, and a hard incentive to become as profitable as quickly as possible. Tarkov didn't have the luxury of being backed by a large studio, instead coming from a small Russian company that was fairly unheard of and as a result had to take a very different route to fund development. Hunt had a premium currency and DLC characters you could purchase, Tarkov simply had different additions to the game, with each higher tier offering an edge. It wasn't pay to win, but it was an easier start with more weapons, armor, and ammo. If you want a full history of Tarkov's development, I highly recommend you watch Veritas's four-part series on the history of Tarkov. But in short, Battlestate Games sought to make a multiplayer, hardcore, fairly realistic shooter, with RPG elements, meaning skills, customization, and exploring. They wanted to essentially make a modern, multiplayer stalker game, and I think that approach is what made the game feel so fresh. While Hunt simply had an XP bar that went up as a form of progression, Tarkov had multiple forms of progression. There's the hideout, there's the skills of your character, there's an in-game economy, but most importantly there are the tasks. Tarkov isn't an easy game to jump into for just one raid. Your experience is the culmination of many raids, successes and stumbles. It's a feedback loop powered by your ability to loot and ability to complete quests. Success begets further success as you're able to better prepare yourself for any task you're trying to accomplish. But as I mentioned before with PUBG, death is death. There is no respawn. You lose that gear, gun, and ammo. Hunt is limited when you consider the singular objective everyone shares. If everyone is playing the objective, they're all going to come into conflict at one point or another. Tarkov's tasks, customization, and economy lead to a very different dynamic. Not everyone is there to do the same thing. You might be hunting for a particular item, or you may need to kill other players, or you might need to hunt after the boss on the map after all. You might be going in fully modern body armor and a high-end weapon, or you might be on a budget and have to go in with a poorly kept World War II Mosin Nagant. Even if two players have the same task, they might approach it wildly differently, choosing their gear based on how they view the game. In the community, this is epitomized by the chads versus the rats. Those who look to fully dominate a lobby, killing all in their path, versus those who look to sneak and ambush for their payday. There is a mad dash for loot, but it's usually for items that sell well or accomplish tasks. Unless you're in really desperate straits, it's probably not to find a weapon to blow away the guy one building over, like it is in Apex or PUBG. Now, so far I've talked primarily about the overarching systems, because they're pretty easy to explain. Incentive systems are designed to keep people coming back one way or another, but if you ask any Tarkov player what keeps them coming back, they probably won't mention any of those things individually. The place where Tarkov really shines is the situations you can find yourself in, and just how invested you can get in your character's life. No, that's not right. Your life. Tarkov is a hard game. Playing it to any serious degree will get the gears in your head turning because you need to think about how you're going to approach things if you don't want a bullet between the eyes. An essential part of this is leveraging the deep customization of the game to build a kit that works for you. Having the armor, the ammo, the weapon, all set up in a way you can reliably use them, each little piece making you a little more resilient, a little more accurate, 
a little more deadly. And then you go against everyone else, yourself hit against the world. You can be weighed down with loot on your way to extract with the exact items you need to complete three quests, and the entire time you're on edge because you know a single shot to the head is enough for anyone to end you, your loss becoming their gain. In shambles, you resign yourself to a budget kit. You can't even buy the gear you used to build your last setup, but as luck would have it, you're in for a treat. Your next game, whether it was by outplaying them, rat tactics, or just blind luck, you find yourself looting the corpse of someone else, and thus the cycle continues. This depth leads to a wholly unique style of gameplay, which to me epitomizes what an extraction shooter should be, much the same way that PUBG in its heyday epitomized battle royales. And just like in that case, you now see other developers taking their own crack at this new style of gameplay, with games like Marauders and Dark and Darker. But of all of the extraction shooters I know of, the only two which have released a 1.0 version are Hunt Showdown and The Cycle Frontier, which is a game. Tarkov is still an open beta, and it seems to be at a juncture in its development. I'll let you do your own research on that. Marauders is in Steam Early Access, and with that has plenty of rough edges to sand out. Dark and Darker appears to have been the most radical take on this new genre so far, being a D&D inspired class based dungeon crawl, but currently it's only had a handful of public tests and isn't even for sale yet. All of this to say that while Tarkov is the raid based shooter right now, I don't think we've seen the full potential of this fledgling category of games yet. Some AAA studios are starting to take note, but most have missed the mark so far. One I'm personally excited for as a Bungie fanboy is their rumored in-development marathon game which is described as a Tarkov-like extraction shooter but with three-man Apex-style squads. Though we're still waiting on an official reveal for any details for how it'll look or play. Whether Tarkov continues to be the premier extraction shooter into the future will be dictated by how Battlestate Games handles the issues it currently finds itself mired in. Honestly, I hope their intended plans come to fruition, and that they're able to navigate the current issues with the game, but really that's something only time will tell. Now, it's been a while since I played. It's been a full wipe since I put any serious time into the game, so a lot has changed. I've been on Lighthouse and Streets of Tarkov only one time each, but recently a friend of mine got into the game, and the Tarkov bug bit me as a result. I'm going to show you one of our raids, and hopefully that gives you an idea of the Tarkov experience. Please pardon the weird compression on my voice, I accidentally had a filter on which I hadn't realized at the time. For the sake of clarity, I did subtitle the whole thing, so I hope you enjoy. Oh, get ready. Here we go. You also have bronze pocket watch, don't you, Austin? Nope, already did that one. Okay. Where are we at? Oh, I know where we're at. Okay. Uh, our exits. Crossroads Trailer Park. Our UAF. Thirteen. Where do we want to try to hit? Smuggler's boat. Uh, are well, we'll be smuggler's Maybe. boat after we go to dorms. But oh yeah, we do have to hit dorms. So I think we start heading towards dorms. Actually. There's two ways we can no, do this. We, uh, we can run there now, expect a fight, or we can kind of hang out for a bit and wait for any business to finish before we get there. We could walk all the way around. We have the time for it. And we're in big red over by the train. We're at um, the very right of the map. Where the, because you see the tanks right there. Enemy across. Not where it. At the tree. Oh, I hear him. He moved oh, towards the hole in the fence. The okay. hole in the wall. I thought I, I heard I... someone. But... Yeah, it was an enemy. I shot at him. But he disappeared. This guy was on full auto, so... No more. Alright, moving up. I heard... Jumping over the pipe. Yeah. Yeah. Alright, careful. He was last seen over at the wall. Yeah. Opening a wall. There's normally more than one of them around here, so be careful. Yeah, usually there's a handful, like three or four. Yeah. I don't see, I don't see anybody through there. Usually there's a sniper up on the building, too. Yeah, they like to chill up there. One on the wind. Oh, oh, where's the him? Nice. Him. I'll let you get that. Thank you. I'm gonna check this little building over here because I know there's a duffel bag in it. It's over by the truck, right? That's where you are. 
Uh, I'm in a trailer. Uh, back towards the fence. Oh, this guy. Another one. On the road. Right. Sounds like he's near the power area. Yeah, he's shooting at me. Um, but my scope is too oh, powerful for me to get an easy shot on him. Over at the pipe. Wall next to the pipe. Wall and pipe. Yeah, be fired at. I think I got him. Yeah, it looks like you got him. I see the blood stain. Alright, I'm the, uh, cutting the power. Power I'm on. coming out. I'm coming okay. towards you guys. Okay. I'm hanging out at the power station or the power yeah, line thing. Power line. Yeah, I'm right next to you. All, All right. right. Cool. Uh, cross the loop I just keep to moving. Load one of my mags. Oh, that's a shame. Oh, did I... oh my god! Is this a laser or a flashlight? Oh, this is a flashlight. Uh, if we sign any shotgun rounds, I could use it. This guy didn't have a lot with him, which is interesting. Oh, he's like to go. You may have dropped him on the ground. Yeah, yeah if you double I tap R. Over, I, I shot. Oh, I pressed R over here though, but I don't see it. Scabs at the grass gas station. Yeah, they have grenades. Oh, boss. Yeah, it's probably scab boss. Run away. I, I think we go towards the uh, hole in the fence. Oh, Tracy runs, Tracy runs, Tracy runs. Oh, that's that's him. That's him. Yeah, uh, oh, let's just book it. Bucking it. Head back Are to the fence. Up? Uh, pull back. Get to the hole in the wall. Go through the wall. Where we were earlier? Yeah, where we were earlier. Uh, I'm here to the left. Uh, be I... careful because we've agitated this gas, so... Yeah. And this guys like to use explosives. Yep. So I think we loop all the way around the power station up there. Go up to the power station? Yeah. Or oh, Okay. Uh, oh, I need to do some healing on my arm. Yeah, I need to heal my chest. That was... They're here. Oh. They're all here. There's two of them. There's multiple of them. Oh, I'm dead. Good luck. They're all there. We should have been faster because we did agitate them. Yeah. Or, you guys can book it if you need to. Oh, the other hole there. in the fence. I thought you meant back where we were, where we came from. That's what I said. You oh. Yes. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I misunderstood. Um, but, yeah. Wow, uh, they're all agitated, so get ready for a fight. If you want to back off and maybe slip them. Okay. There's still I killed a guy one over there. Them. Yeah, I'm going to take that guy's stuff. These guys tend to have good... good. Alright, ready? Yeah. Alright, so let's, let's I we throw the back. I said we don't sprint. I said we just walk. Well, well, let's go further back this way. That way, they don't lob grenades at us. So, yeah. uh, you wouldn't happen to have any pain meds, would you? Pain meds? Yeah. No. I got a grizzly. I could drop, and you could use it, and then give it back to me. But I don't think that has pain meds. No, it doesn't. Uh. Because I've got my vision blurry right now. I should have brought my car kit with me, but I didn't. So we're at Shack now? Uh, we're near the power station right now. Yeah, I'm at the power station. Power station should have a box of meds within the house, it within the shack. No, oh, that's true. Yeah. Let me know if there's anything in it. Here, I'm running up. Other ways, on the um, northeast side, there, along the wall, there's also a stash container that could have meds. Oh yeah, I forgot meds. about that stash. It has meds in a syringe. Yeah. Last time I was in there, it had, um, it got me, like, a green flare, so I was gonna, so I always check that place. Oh, meds meds, not yeah, pain not pill meds. meds. Okay. I thought you could take those, but... At one point you could. Oh. oh. Yeah, pull back. This is me. Here, let's just run towards the train tracks. Why is he spawning so much today, man? He wants you to kill him. I feel like it's really hard to judge distance and direction now with the sound. Mm -hmm. Where they made those changes. 
checking this level back real quick. Okay. Yeah. Ready? Yep. Okay. Oh, well, let's get Operation Aquarius done. I'm oh, back wait. closer towards the wall. Where'd you go? I'm by a tree. I thought I heard something. Is I'm that you running? I'm over by the wall. Oh, uh, by the, the bushes. Somebody towards the building? Dorms? Yeah, uh, coming up on our left. Oh, I'm running back towards the wall. I'm right behind you. Okay. Down the hill where I'm pointing, somewhere. Can you hear him? No. Are you sure it wasn't me? No, they were coming from the building. I saw them. Oh. I'm sneaking into this bush. I'm just gonna sit here for a minute. Is that you shooting? No. I'm right behind you in the bush, too. Oh, okay. I mean, if he left the building, we can go into it, right? Or... The thing is, I think he saw me, too. Uh, I'm gonna move up. Yeah, let, let's run into the building. Let's go up the stairs and in. Yeah, I like that. Just be wary of dorm three. Oh, yeah, all this is open. Alright, 206 is the room. Yeah. It's this one right here. Yep. It's unlocked. There we go. All done. Ugh. Yeah, they have all this looted. Um, do you have any other keys? Uh, no. Guy at the bottom of the stairs? I uh, got him. Reloading. You killed him? Yeah, I killed him. I think it was a scav. Oh. Looks like a scav. Another dead scav in here. Yeah, all these rooms are open, so they have keys. I don't have any other keys on me, unfortunately. See what these guys had, if anything. This guy Jack. Yeah, that guy had nothing on him. Uh, I'm going to top off some mags, so I'm going to run into the bathroom real quick. Okay. I'm going to be hiding in the very back of it. Okay. Uh, I think all my mags are topped off. So, yeah, I think we run for Bronze Pocket Watch while we have an opportunity. I don't remember where that is. Uh, I do. It's no problem. Can you tell me, roughly, so I know where we're going and I don't get lost? Um, I don't know how to point it out on the map. So, you know where the truck is near, uh, Crack House? Yeah. Uh, it's in that truck. Uh, did you already check this dude over here? I did check that guy, yeah. Okay. So, we're essentially going to be crossing the road here. Here, follow me. I think we just disregard three-story entirely. Yeah, let's go through the hole. I thought about going around a long way, but... Alright. And we're going right.
Oh, I see it. It's a scare. Can I have my fronts? No, he's he's still up. He ran left. Oh, sniper scav. Great. I might have got him. I can't really tell. Like I said, I have my front side is being. I don't see anyone up there. Okay. All right, moving up. Oh, there he is. Well done. Got him. Okay. Reloading. All right, I'm gonna you get the box. Try and loot this, or I don't even want loot. I just want the pocket watch. Okay. I, I'm actually full entirely, so. Oh, I am not. <laughs> oh well, we can keep looting if you want. No, no, I can help you extract them. We can loot. It's best okay. Get your quest done. So we got trailer park extract. <clears throat> oh, I'm getting shot. Oh, where? I don't know where from, but that was behind us. I know that. I'm through the fence now. I, I am too. I don't know how he didn't shoot at me. One on the Bro, how are we missing these shots? Garbo guns. Oh, I'm dead. Oh, you're dead? Yep. Dude. Well, I got the scab. Where'd you die? In a bush off to the left. Oh. Maybe I should've just done single fire or whatever. Yeah, I, I'm just gonna run and get out. It says I, I got him. Maybe it was a different scav. Oh, getting shot at. Hide in this building. Oh, Lord. I've had better runs, but I've also had worse runs. <laughs> but I do need to get out. I'm about to run out of food. Uh, so where do I need to go? Is... Smuggler's Boat. I'll try that. Yeah, if you go towards main bridge and take the right... Yeah, Smuggler's Boat is open. If only we just ran straight across, we could have been good. <clears throat> I might not have killed that sniper scab after all. I think that's what hit me and surprised both of us. Oh, I would do it. But then, uh, the, what you call it, the scabs the we were shooting. by Ice Cream Shack, yeah. Yeah, that dude I, I did end up killing, but uh, I think it was right after you said you died. If you've watched up to this point, I hope you enjoyed our shenanigans. But before you go, I'd like to share two announcements. First, my voice is back. Like three days after I put out the zombie plague PSA, something in me switched and my uncontrollable cough drastically reduced. Second, I'm diversifying. For those who aren't aware, YouTube policies have been getting kind of weird recently, negatively impacting creators of all sizes. Between that and the recent change in CEOs, I've made the decision to listen to some of the larger creators I follow. From here on out, I'll be mirroring all of my videos onto Odyssey, a growing YouTube alternative. I'm also opening up a coffee page so you can donate to me directly to support further videos. I'm using coffee because of all existing platforms for supporting creators, it has the most favorable rates. With YouTube super chats and memberships, YouTube takes a flat 30% right off the top. Patreon, meanwhile, varies depending on your plan between 5 and 12% plus payment processing fees. Coffee has a 0% fee for one-time donations, 
and a 5% fee for recurring monthly donations, plus payment processing fees. It'll be some time before I get the benefits fully rolled out, as I'm still new to all of this, but I'll be sure to keep you guys in the loop. For now, I want to thank you all for your support, and I will see you next time.